recording and uh, we can begin pretty much where we left off last week. So I believe that this week is the 10th sort of class. Time really flies. And it's so enjoyable for me as well that uh, it's just incredible to think that we've been 10 already. So how did we end last week? We went through the sutta called the Vatupama Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number seven. And we did the whole sutta because in this book, there's only um, a list of the various uh, imperfections or impurities that defile the mind. And the Pali word is upakilesa. Um, I'm not quite sure why they use the word upakilesa in this case, because in the upakilesa sutta, there are different um, kind of defilements and they're considered a little bit more um, a little bit more subtle, not as coarse as the five hindrances. But many of these um, impurities that we discussed last week are, are very close to the five hindrances. They're sort of variations on that theme. So for those who don't know, the five hindrances are usually dubbed. I think it's Ajahn Brahmali coined that term, the um, public enemy number one, or well, it's probably Ajahn Brahm. We're all just brainwashed by Ajahn Brahm, so we all repeat what he says. Uh, public enemy number one <coughs> in terms of being an obscuration to seeing things clearly, to seeing the truth. And, uh, and the whole practice of meditation, in a sense, is to learn to overcome those hindrances. First of all, we restrain them, and later on, we abandon them completely. So the gradual training is, first of all, about restraint learning to work with them, learning to re respond skillfully rather than, you know, generate more suffering by unskillful ways of, for example, responding to anger with more anger or craving with a kind of suppression that never works. So we learn to handle them skillfully and use some of the antidotes. And then later on, we actually start to overcome them when the mind starts to quieten become very mindful, we can even catch these things before they fully manifest in the mind. It's almost like we catch them just as they start bubbling up and the mind starts to get so skilled that it can just recognize very quickly, subverbally, that this is not worth holding on to. This is a obscuration of the mind. It's unwholesome, it leads to suffering. It's not going to serve me in any way. So the mind starts to become wise and, and, and inclines in the opposite direction towards the seven enlightenment factors or the seven bodhiangas, awakening factors, limbs of awakening, wings of awakening, depending how you want to translate that. So that the awakening factors start to develop in direct proportion to um, the hindrances being diminished. And of course, there are things we can do to encourage that as well. So we went through the whole sutta last week and there was one particular part of that sutta that I wanted to just fill out a little bit because at some point in there, I haven't got it with me now, but um, the Buddha was saying that when we abandon those um, defilements, when we know that they're imperfections of the mind, we're able to abandon them. And when we abandon them, we can access the deep states of samadhi, yeah, the jhana states. And soon after that, it said that, um, that we become assured of, actually, I'm not quite sure what the words were, but basically it jumped, it seemed to jump to the stages of enlightenment, right? So suddenly we were at Samadhi and then suddenly we were enlightened. And there's a bit in between, which is important. And this is uh, what we'll be talking about a lot in the upcoming retreat, but it's also this sequence, which is so pivotal in the suttas and in Pali, that is Samadhi, Pachaya Yatabhuta Jnana Dasana. And it means from Samadhi, in other words, when we are able to purify the mind and see things clearly, we have a chance to see things as they truly are. So from Samadhi, we can gain insight into the way things are. And that is why sometimes it goes straight from Samadhi to enlightenment. It's not that Samadhi is enlightenment, it's only a stepping stone, but because those hindrances have been removed from the mind, you can think of them like curtains or veils, you've seen through the veil for a moment. And if you can see through that veil for a long time and you can really look from a different perspective and keep your mind on the reality for long enough, you can have a chance to penetrate into the characteristics of suffering, impermanence and non-self. You can have a chance to see the Four Noble Truths, to see things like 
um, the fact that everything arises and passes and therefore cannot belong to me, cannot be myself. How can something that's basically subject to cessation, that's disappearing, that's vanishing in front of your mind, how can that be a self? What's the point of that being a self? You know, and when you see that very clearly, that it doesn't, there's nothing to cling to. It's not only that it doesn't make sense to cling, it's also that there's nothing actually to hold because it's just like slipping through your fingers like sand, you know, it's like holding sand and you've got, even if you hold your fingers really tightly together, some gets through, right? <laughs> you can hold it as tight as you want, but the sand will just pass through. So then there becomes no point to clinging and holding on. But that's obviously a very high stage on the path. And we can experience that to greater or lesser degrees along the way. So, so that was last week. And this week, we're getting into two kinds of thought, which is another really important sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. I think it's number 19. And it's on page 39 for those who have the book, this book, just in case anyone's new and hasn't got this book. And uh, it's, it's a really encouraging sutta, I think, because it starts off with the Buddha's own explanation of his meditation and, uh, and the things that he experienced and how he overcame the thinking mind. Yeah? So first of all, he learned to differentiate between unwholesome and wholesome thought. But later on, he went even further and learned how to still the mind and go beyond thought completely. So in this sutta is actually um, the sutta before another one called Vitakasantana Sutta. And that actually is often translated as removing the removal of distracting thoughts. But the literal translation just says removal of thoughts. There's no word distracting in there because as he explains in this sutta, any thought eventually becomes an agitation. It's an obstacle to the beautiful still depths of samadhi, of a really still quiet mind. So I'm going to read little bits and pause at the end of each paragraph or maybe halfway through and invite any reflection that anybody has. Let's make it practical. Let's make it, you know, relevant to your lives um, because all of us struggle with the thinking mind. Uh, and I'm sure we can learn from each other and not only from the verbatim words. So we can have some discussion and you'll probably notice that you're muted now, but if you want to raise your hand at any point when I pause, there's a raise hand button. Um, in some people's, I don't know, it changes every week for me. Sometimes there's a raise hand button that's separate and sometimes there's another button, not the participants one, reactions, that's right, and it's under there. So if you do that, then we can come to you and give you permission to unmute, okay? So any questions before we carry on? All good, so let's get into it. So the two kinds of thought. So I'll say bhikkhunis, okay? Because <laughs> it's monks as usual. <laughs> so bhikkhunis, but it includes everyone. It includes the lay people who may well have been listening as well. Before my enlightenment, so this is the Buddha speaking, while I was still an unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes, or in two, two types, if you like. Then I set on one side thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of harming. And I set on the other side thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of benevolence, and thoughts of harmlessness. So this is already interesting in a number of ways. First of all, this is the Buddha speaking about his experience before enlightenment. And sometimes we think that the Buddha was different from us. We think that he was some kind of superhuman or, you know, he's been practicing for eons, which I'm sure he had. And yet still here he is defining himself finding himself you know, having these thoughts that are really most unwanted, right? Thoughts of sensual desire, of ill will and of harming. Even the Buddha had these kind of thoughts. So he also struggled. 
he wasn't already perfect and he wasn't really as different from us as we may think. So I think that gives a lot of encouragement, at least for me. And the second sentence, while I was still an unenlightened bodhisattva, is also interesting because the word bodhisattva is exactly the same as the Mahayana term bodhisattva. And sometimes in the Mahayana tradition, they talk, they have a different um, uh, philosophical idea around bodhisattvas. But according to the early Buddhist text, bodhisattvas are beings who are on the path to awakening. They're not already enlightened, okay? So you're actually a bodhisattva before you become an arahat. So in the Mahayana tradition, which was a later tradition, they tried to say that bodhisattvas are actually superior and it's almost like a higher stage than a selfish sort of dried up arahat who's liberated, but they're sort of, you know, only concerned about their own welfare. I don't think that idea is found anywhere in the early Buddhist texts, because from the very outset of the practice, one is motivated by deep sympathy and compassion for the suffering of living beings. You know, at the heart of the practice is this motivation of compassion, motivation to, to practice for the benefit of all beings and to help others as well as ourselves to come out of suffering. So it's interesting how things develop later, but as far as the early Buddhist texts go, um, the Bodhisattva is the person on the path. And I think whether we're on the path or whether we're already fully enlightened, we should always be inclining our mind to thinking about not only our own practice, but others as well. And sometimes people think that's two different things, you know, that I'm either meditating or I'm serving. But the serving deepens your practice. The serving is part of developing the path. And so the two can't really be separated. If you're practicing, but you're not developing the feeling of serving others, the feeling of gratitude, wanting to share what you've learned, then it hasn't really impacted your life as fully as it might, you know, because it's just natural, isn't it, that in life, if we find something that really transforms our life, really starts to benefit us, we just can't wait to tell other people. Even if you watch a movie that you enjoyed, you know, that brought you some even just interest or maybe some stimulation, maybe even some, I don't know, positive emotional response, you want to share it straight away, right? Maybe you'll buy a gift for a friend. So you go a little bit out of your way to share the good things in your life. And all the more so for the practice, the path. So then he divides his thoughts. He realizes that, you know, sometimes his thoughts are quite wholesome, but other times they're not. So there are these two different types. And I really like this idea of just dividing them into two, two separate categories because it's devoid of judgment. He's not saying, oh, this is so terrible. These are really bad and evil. These are like, this is means something about me. You know, I'm so bad, I'm so terrible because of these thoughts. But rather it's like, so these kind of thoughts arise and these kind of thoughts also arise. So it's just very pragmatic, very uh, objective in a sense. And for those who know a little bit more about the path, the Pali path and the Eightfold Path, um, the thoughts that he's describing here are exactly identical to the th three right intentions, yeah? So the positive side, thoughts of renunciation, that's nekama sankapa in the second factor of the path. Thoughts of benevolence, avyapa, avyapada sankapa, non-ill will, metta, loving kindness. And thoughts of harmlessness is avihimsaka sankapa which literally means like non-violence, non-harm, non-cruelty, yeah? So here he's saying the opposite of those three as well. So the opposite of right intention, right motivation, right thought is sensuality, thoughts of sensuality, ill will and harming. So shall I continue? <laughs> I'll continue on. As I dwell thus, diligent, ardent and resolute, a thought of sensual desire, a thought of ill will, or a thought of harming arose in me. I understood thus, this unwholesome or bad thought has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. Again, the compassion. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana. When I considered this leads to my own affliction, it subsided in me. 
When I considered this leads to others' affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to the affliction of both, it subsided in me. When I considered this obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties and leads away from Nibbana, it subsided in me. Whenever a thought of sensual desire, a thought of ill will or a thought of harming arose in me, I abandoned it, removed it, did away with it. There's quite a lot in this, quite a lot. He was already dwelling diligent, ardent and resolute. And yet still that thought arose because thoughts just arise, right? <laughs> when the mind is not tamed, when we still have a certain conditioning in our mind, even if we're very resolute, even if we say to ourselves, I won't get carried away by unwholesome thoughts, still they arise, even for the Buddha to be. And then he used this particular way of reflection again, rather than, oh no, this is terrible. I'm such a bad person. I'm never going to get enlightened. He took the I out of it. First of all, he was concerned about its effect, right? So it leads to affliction. So a sense of compassion arose. If it leads to affliction and you care about your well-being and others' well-being, then you know, it doesn't make much sense to keep that thought. And then he said it, it obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties and leads away from Nibbana. So again, it's not, I can't get into Nibbana. I've not got a hope on the path. I'll never attain Nibbana. It's just knowing this leads to Nibbana, this doesn't. It's a law of nature, right? And just that consideration caused it to subside. So this is a little bit like the second way of reflecting in Vitaka Santana Sutta, the next one, the next sutta that I mentioned. Because in that sutta, number 20 in the Majjhima Nikaya, it gives five ways of overcoming thought. And the second one is to see the danger in that thought, see the danger. So I think this is pretty much similar to that, you know, seeing that this thought is not going to help me in any way, right? It's going to obscure the mind. It's going to generate hindrances, basically, um, and cause difficulties for me. And it's just through that reflection that he was able to abandon, remove, and do away with the thought, not through force, not through saying, I don't want this. So even though abandoning, removing and doing away with it may sound quite strong, quite almost violent and um, aggressive in a sense, it's actually a result of um, just seeing that this causes suffering, right? It's not taking me to a peaceful place. It's causing more and more suffering. And I think it's amazing that the mind, the human mind, once it realizes that it naturally drops these things. It's like you pick up a hot coal you might not know, like a child, say, picks up a hot coal. They really don't know what it is. They just want to touch it. And they just withdraw instantly. You, know, you don't have to tell them, like, move your hand away from the heat. It's just an instinctive reaction. And they'll not do that again, because that's obviously an extreme situation. Yet with thoughts, we do tend to do it again and again and again. And the mind takes a little bit of learning. You know, you do it, you realize you've wasted a whole hour or you've just, you know, you sat down to meditate and you just churned up a difficult conversation and it led to more and more complicated emotions and thoughts. And uh, sometimes we do this because we're just so involved with the content of that thought that we forget, oh, is this actually leading to harm or is it leading to good? The minute you realize, wow, what am I doing here with my mind? You know, I'm harming myself. I'm harming uh, my own peace. I'm moving in the opposite way from what I want to be moving in. As soon as we realize that, we have this beautiful, almost innate capacity that the human mind just wants to drop it. So I think that's very nice. Are there any questions so far? Or comments or... Maybe you want to share your experience, whether that sort of method has worked for you. Do you resonate with that? Okay, first question is from James. Hi. Hello. <clears throat> Not so much a question, just a reflection. Great. I've got to say that um, this is an incredibly useful kind of sort of, it's, it's just so practical. And, um, you know, when I first read this, it's been a few months now, really started to sort of pay attention to where my thoughts are going. And it's, it's um, I think, I think, to be honest, it, I was almost kind of a bit dismayed to begin with, because I consider myself a fairly benevolent person anyway. 
But when you when I really started looking and realised how much little ill will things, I mean, I, I noticed it when driving, it's little things like, oh, that idiot doing that, or he shouldn't be parking there. And it just, <laughs> it's just so much going on that I hadn't previously noticed. So it's interesting to pay attention more, really. So, mm. so it's been really useful. But I'm finding that paying attention to it has reduced it. And, and and though I still have tons of the little the little grievances, you know, petty grievances, nowadays they don't tend to to like you know when you start off with the, with that person did that, and then it leads to another thought, then another thought, and before you know it, you, you've thought yourself into a really bad state of mind, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I I find nowadays that that I can I can nip it in the bud straight off, you know, without going on that little roller coaster. So nowadays I actually find it. It can actually be quite funny what my mind comes up with sometimes, you know, yeah. silly little petty things that before probably would have just sent me spiraling into a sort of bad mood. I just sort of cut it off like that and think, no, no that's not like that. And now I can, it almost makes me laugh because it's just so silly, you know. Great, great, fabulous. It's such yeah, a idea that's so effective. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just do noticing exactly. Yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> Shall we go to, it's Debbie, okay, well, isn't it? Welcome, Debbie. Is that okay. good? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Okay. Um, yeah, this is really relevant at the moment because, um, because I'm working from home and we're just communicating via Teams and, and type into each other. I find that you can misconstrue messages and you can think bad thoughts about the person that you're typing to because you believe that they've they've got this certain attitude about you you make all sorts of things up in your head and then before you realize it you're having bad thoughts about them and you think oh look at them doing that and look at them doing that and you know and your mind starts going right out of control and whereas really they've done nothing at all um so you know it's really it's it's really important to keep checking in with yourself and go no hang on a minute what what is actually going on here what has she done nothing why are you yeah. reacting in this way so yeah it's so easy to get bad thoughts about people um when you're not talking to them face to face mm. So, mm. thank you for this it's it, it's really gonna it's gonna help Definitely. That's wonderful. Mm. I really relate to that because it's so hard with an email which has no sort of um, tone. You can't hear the tone of a person's voice. You can't hear, you can't empathize through sort of, you know, little body language cues or any of that. And so, yeah, what we hear is only in a way what our own mind makes of those words. It's not what that person actually said. And and we can spend so much time, we can waste so much time trying to work it out. <laughs> Whereas this just cuts through that and says, is it causing me harm and others harm to think this way or not? Not is this right or not? Did they mean it this way or not? But just, is it leading to harm or, so, or is it not leading to harm? That simple, yeah, fabulous. Really important. Most of my communication is also online these days. <laughs> Can I just come to a comment in the box and then we'll come to Darren. I'll just read out something from the question or oh, from the box. It's not enough to notice that something like a thought may do harm. Otherwise the world would be a better place, I think. We usually do and think the same things and make the same mistakes, even if they harm us or others. Yeah, that's really true. And I think it's true that it's not enough to just notice it, you know, as it arises. It's a good, it's a training that we need to implement time and time and time again. And remember here, the Buddha's not saying he's simply noticing a thought. He's already meditating, diligent, ardent, and resolute. So it's an embodied experience as well. It's an experience where he can really easily notice within his mind and body that this thought has a particular effect. It's different from intellectualizing it. It's a much deeper experience of that truth. And I think this is where the real progress, the real transformation comes. We have to actually sit with ourselves. We have to see what we're doing to ourselves, you know, again and again and again, depending on how quick we are to, <laughs> to gain wisdom. You know, the Buddha was maybe much quicker than we are, but it doesn't matter because every time we notice it, 
every time we notice it, we're, we're taking a step. Mm. So next one. Hi. Um, hi there. Um, it's just such a really powerful reading because I think from the readings a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about coveting, um, I was then using that as a as a tool to, to beat myself up um, because I was just feeling so bad about myself because it, it was just I was tr trying to be on this path and trying to be trying to be good and I think inherently I'm good but then when these um, mm -hmm. thoughts of ill will towards others or coveting came in I was thinking I should know better and I was just yeah. be using this massive stick to beat myself up with yeah. um, and um, it's just been really powerful to think reading this to think I can't control the first thought and yeah. if that thought comes in it doesn't that doesn't dictate who I am as a person yeah. it's then I think um being aware of those thoughts yeah. and saying okay it's come in and then just it's like sitting on the bank and just watching this watching the stream of emotions then go by and not yeah. jumping in that river um yeah. and and yeah and drowning with those emotions um, mm. i think the fact that it's so just saying that the, the buddha before enlightenment was going through this it's like an, okay i'm not too bad then uh, yes so it's been quite um yeah a revelation i think or yeah, reassuring wonderful. as well mm -hmm. um, so yeah thank you great wonderful yeah i think that's true isn't it recognizing this is just a universal experience and um as james said before it's like we are good people but sometimes when we start to meditate we see all these things in our mind that didn't we didn't realize were there before the thing is they always were there so it's not that by meditating you suddenly become full of ill will or more covetous uh, it's just that we weren't aware before so the first step always starts with just recognizing the content of the mind and and then we learn as you say what to do with it you know how to relate to it in a way that doesn't lead to building that suffering around it um, and I think that's why it's so helpful to read the Buddha's words because they're always so um, like there's another sutta called the Avana Vibhanga Sutta and he says you know when he teaches the Dhamma he just teaches the Dhamma for example he doesn't say those people that do this and this and this um, get this and this result. What he does say is this and this action leads to this and this result. So he always depersonalizes it and it starts to look much more like just a pattern of conditioning, a pattern like a cause and effect process. You know, just nature, like you say, that beautiful simile that you used of the river, it's just nature doing its thing. But we do have some influence once we have that awareness, you know, once we hear the teachings, it's like we put a different program in there and then that starts to bear its effects. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. I'm so glad it's encouraging. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Janaki, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, the, the method that I adopt is actually the sublimation so that um, a, any bad thought that comes into my mind that I could change it into something really, I mean, uh, something not harmful or harmless. Um, so I can get rid of the effect of that or the result of that. Um, so I think uh, sublimation is a good practice, which um, uh, <laughs> I am trying, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I think you're talking about the um, act of sort of replacing one thought with another more skillful thought, yes? Which is, uh, is that right? Yeah. Sorry, you're muted again. Suppose if somebody wanted to harm me or, yeah. or some other person, so by sublimation, so I can transfer or change that, that thing yeah better one by understanding why that person did it mm, and then mm. i feel that i there's nothing to be i mean there's no reason to be angry because because that the, the fault is with that other person not me actually yeah so trying yeah. to yeah yeah so yeah I yeah why that person did it yes it's a way of wise reflection it's also part of sense restraint 
that's what really sense restraint means is learning to look at things from a different angle one that will help us to come out of that negative thought yeah yeah great excellent thank you can i just check if diana still wanted to ask something or comment are you good okay i'll just read the follow-up from Steph. Uh, maybe it can be frustrating sometimes with ourselves and others. We can see those patterns, but we can't always stop them. Yesterday, I talked to a friend. He saw this pattern and how bad that was for him, but he can't stop doing it. So it can be frustrating to see how something is bad for ourselves and others, and still we do it again. Understanding is not enough. Yeah, uh, I do trust understanding. I do trust the path, but... We really need patience with ourselves. We really need to give this practice time, you know, and not expect really quick, immediate results because we're trying to change, you know, a lifetime's patterns, a lifetime that we don't even really, we're not even so aware of, right? We're not so aware of where it all began. And, you know, if you believe in past lives, which to me seems very, very plausible, we have many, many eons of conditioning. So we can't just stop those thoughts as soon as they arise. And also, if we're trying to stop them through ill will because we think they're bad and terrible, we're actually, it's very subtle, you know, the difference between just noticing this is harming me, it's not good for me, and saying, oh, this is bad, I don't want this, is quite subtle, but it's the difference between compassion and actually a subtle form of ill will. So sometimes we have these unwanted thoughts arising and we actually feel like a sense of, frustration, irritation, even hate towards those thoughts. And that is just exacerbating the problem. You're reacting to ill will with ill will. So it's a really, um, it, it requires understanding. It also requires a lot of loving kindness as well. And a lot of patience, a lot of patience and also trust. You know, trusting that this makes sense. It should work eventually. Like it makes sense that it would work. If it's not working yet, just, you know, give it a little bit more time. So. I hope that understand that um, helps and I hope that um, yeah your friend or all of us can develop a little bit more gentleness and patience with ourselves and notice when you're not having those thoughts you know I'm sure that most of the time he's not having those thoughts he's probably just noticing when he is remember the Buddha's dividing these thoughts into two categories we've not got to the second one yet so I'm sure he's also having the second category of thoughts as well sometimes we can incline our mind that way and it gives us some perspective that there's a lot of good stuff in there too. Mm -hmm. So becoming aware is a good thing, especially when we can notice the different uh, effect of thinking thoughts of harm, you know, thoughts that are unkind, even towards ourselves. like I'm not good at this, I shouldn't be thinking this, this is thoughts of harm, and thoughts of compassion. Mm -hmm. Oh, this hurts, this is a painful thought, you know, I'm doing this again oh, it's okay, you know, I can just give myself a bit of compassion here, you know, I'm learning, I'm learning, and you start to notice when you're having the positive thoughts, the thoughts of uh, benevolence, renunciation, harmlessness, how does that feel? So you show your mind, look mind, look, this is how it feels, you feel it in your body, you know, when you're having a beautiful thought about your life or about someone who sent you a beautiful gift of flowers, which happened to me yesterday, it's very rare, and I have these fantastic flowers. I've also been feeling quite burned out actually as well, but I can either concentrate on that or I can look at the flowers. And really it's helped, it's helped so much, it's incredible. Just how, you know, all these acts of care and this sort of inclining the mind to beautiful things can really give you a different perspective. So not always looking only at the difficulties, only at the problems. Yeah, Avanti said, thoughts are not facts. That's actually taught in the mindfulness training. I think it's like a catchphrase that they use in the mindfulness uh, courses. I can see there's quite a few more comments. I want to just come to Mira because she's got a hand up and then I'll come back to the box a bit later, maybe. I know it's also important, isn't it? Uh, yeah, okay, maybe I'll finish. Okay, let's go to... Hi. Yeah, hello. I, I just wanted to, to make a notation on a, on a bodily uh, level. I, I did some Feldenkrais. I don't mm. know if you know the Feldenkrais system. And when you got the tension in the body and you just observe what's happening, okay, then the tension releases. 
It's, it's the same, I think, also with the mind. When you mm. serve your mind, then it releases. And yeah. the released um, way to be is to be harmless. Yeah. And, and that's, it's, um, when you, when you uh, stop observing, then the hand goes back to that. Because <laughs> it learned that. Yeah. And then you get again, oh, okay, ah. And it goes fast and faster than you the, to, to observe this and to get less tension in the hand, for example, because I'm a piano teacher. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, it flows only. You can only play very fast when you're not full of tension. Right. It's, it's really, uh, it's wonderful to, to see this. And it works also, I hope, <laughs> yeah. with the mind. Yeah, yeah super. It's a long way. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That is one of the Buddha's great um, insights that the mind and the body are so connected, you know, that uh, I think somewhere in the suttas, and I'm not sure where, it might be the commentaries, he says, um, Sabbe Dhamma Vedana Samosaranam, which means like all Dhammas, all experience, every mental quality flows with sensation. It comes together, it's co joined with sensations in the body and in the mind. So it's usually in the body, right? Most sensation is on the body base. And when we do practice with the body, like you've practiced with Feldenkrais, and I've practiced a lot with like the Goenka method of Vipassana, which is basically keeping your awareness constantly inside the body. You just notice whenever a thought comes, even before it comes, you can feel the effect of it in your body. Like you get that felt sense of it before it can even fully arise and manifest so it's absolutely fascinating yeah absolutely fascinating and just by staying with that you know you see it's all fading and the thoughts as well fade so it's, it's very similar I think there's that sort of allowing of it and by allowing it it can pass through it can uh, dissipate if you like so yeah there are different ways of working with these things but the Buddha's talking here just about one of the first methods which is differentiating the harmful from the unharmful thoughts, like the beneficial and the unbeneficial thoughts, which sounds like a preliminary thing. And yet so often we get caught up in unwholesome things for ages, not realizing that we're harming ourselves, you know? It's crazy. So, okay, yeah. So again, someone's saying, I understand that intellectually, I understand that intellectually, but sometimes it's really hard not to believe a bad thought about myself. Do you have any suggestion on how to modify that response to conditioned thoughts? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of suggestions in, in these suttas. So I think I should probably read through this one because um, this one is particularly about noticing the effect of the unhelpful thoughts and the more helpful thoughts. But as I said, there's a whole other sutta and I would advise you probably to go into that uh, maybe after this class. Uh, maybe everyone can have that as a homework, <laughs> uh, because there are five different methods in there. And the first one is maybe close to what you're saying, modifying the response. It's like substituting one thought for a, a more wholesome thought. So you see, for example, that you say to yourself, oh my goodness, you've done that again. And uh, what I'm finding now is that when I speak like that to myself, I quite quickly say, oh, it's all right, sweetie, you know, it's okay, like, you're doing good. I actually said that to myself today, it came quite spontaneously because I just kind of figured what I want to talk about on Ajahn Pramali's retreat. And I'm like, well done, you know, you've done really good. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so it's a practice. I, I, I really recommend loving kindness because most of the time we have bad thoughts about ourselves, they're ill will, they're ill will and aversion towards ourselves. So loving kindness is a practice also achieves the substitution aspect because Loving kindness uses thought in a skillful way. You can actually use inner thought, like an inner monologue. I think you've been to my meta sessions. So you just keep doing that, you know, and say those words, say those phrases like, may I be well, may I be happy, or, you know, but it has to be real. It has to be genuinely heartfelt, right? Or may I experience peace. Even may I learn to speak to myself kindly, whatever it is you want to say to yourself, yeah? um and just repeat it repeat it and after a while it starts to bring up an emotion and that starts to influence 
the way you relate to yourself during the day. And you might just find, you know, a lot of the time you will think unwholesome or harmful thoughts to yourself, cruel thoughts, unkind thoughts. But once in a while you'll find, oh, a really beautiful thought arises. And you think, where did that come from? And then you realize, oh yeah, I've been doing this meta practice. Maybe it's having some effect. So don't expect it to take away all the old conditioning straight away, but notice when you have the opposite conditioning starting to bear fruit as well. Sometimes we don't recognize that. Okay, so let's carry on with this sutta because the next one is really beautiful, the next little paragraph. And not to freak you out because this just shows that the mind is conditioned, okay? So don't worry about that. So we'll have bhikkhunis again. We'll have monks later, just to be fair. Bhikkhunis, whatever a bhikkhuni frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of her mind. Mm. If she frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of sensual desire, she has abandoned the thought of renunciation to cultivate the thought of sensual desire. And then her mind inclines to thoughts of sensual desire. If she frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of ill will, then she has abandoned the thought of, oh, it's dot, dot, dot here, the thought of benevolence uh, to cultivate the thought of ill will. And then her mind inclines to thoughts of ill will. If she frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of harming, she has abandoned the thought of harmlessness or gentleness or kindness, if you like, to cultivate the thought of harming. And then her mind inclines to thoughts of harming. So I'll give the simile. Just as in the last month of the rainy season in the autumn, when the crops thicken, a cowherd would guard his cows by constantly tapping and poking them on this side and that with a stick to check and curb them. Why is that? because he sees that they could be flogged, imprisoned, fined, or blamed if he lets them stray into the crops. So too, I saw in unwholesome states, danger, degradation, and defilement, and in wholesome states, the blessing of renunciation, the aspect of cleansing. So this is very nice because it's basically saying that whatever we think and ponder upon becomes the inclination of our mind. It becomes, it's basically what I was just saying, it becomes more and more likely that you're going to start having more thoughts of loving kindness, you know, until it becomes an inclination. You naturally start to veer in a wholesome direction. It becomes like a reconditioning of the mind. And uh, some people say, you know, that inclination of the mind, it's almost like it becomes your character. You know, and you meet people who just have this natural character of goodness and kindness. It's almost their natural response. Or they see somebody suffering. They might still feel, you know, I don't know, a little bit overwhelmed at first, but their instinct will be just to respond with compassion to see what they can do to help. So it's beautiful. The power of the thoughts, you know, is something that's uh, shaping our karma, if you like, you know, where we're coming from matters. And that uh, becomes stronger and stronger until we just start leaning on the side of the good. So don't worry if you see unwholesome thoughts. That's the other side, right? You might think, oh, no, I'm having wholesome thoughts. It's becoming the inclination. But like we said before, you know, you already had those thoughts. Now you're just becoming more aware. And uh, anyone on the path of Dhamma is already motivated by beautiful qualities, and by a lot of wisdom and compassion. So, um, so it's not a problem. And here also it's saying about when you have a thought of sensual desire, you've abandoned the thought of renunciation to cultivate the thought of sensual desire. So you can't have the two at the same time. <laughs> they cannot coexist, which is great because when you're practicing metta, this is why I love the practice. You might think you're getting nowhere. You might think, oh, I'm just repeating these phrases. I don't feel any meta. It's like I'm a robot, just blah, blah, blah. But actually, when you're having that thought, you're keeping out thoughts of ill will. It's not possible to think a thought of ill will at the same time as may I be happy, right? Just for that thought, if you can stay with those words, may I be happy, 
you abandoned thoughts of ill will to cultivate thoughts of loving kindness. So this becomes your power, your reconditioning of the mind. So, so, so the Buddha's taking the advantage of this, of this a little bit further before he was saying uh, about the obstruction, etc. And uh, what else? Yeah, he was saying more about the um, negative effect of the unwholesome thought. But now he's also saying that he sees the unwholesome, in the unwholesome states, danger, degradation, and defilement. But in wholesome states, the blessing of renunciation and the aspect of cleansing, which is very nice, isn't it? So it's the blessing of letting go of those things in this case, letting go of the unwholesome thoughts and the aspect of cleansing. So you're cleaning your mind. It's like every morning or evening, I don't know, you have a wash to clean your body. But whenever we sit down to meditate, we're cleaning our mind. We think it doesn't matter because no one can see our mind, but we experience our mind. And the Buddha said, you know, there's nothing as harmful as an untrained mind for you or for anyone else. So we're cleaning, cleansing our mind. It's very beautiful. So now we're getting on to the wholesome ones. Shall I continue a little bit? We'll have some more time to talk later. Yeah. So see how this makes you feel hearing this part of the sutta. Because it's different when we talk about wholesome states. There's a different feeling in the body and mind, I find. As I dwelled thus, diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of renunciation, a thought of benevolence, or a thought of harmlessness arose in me, probably at separate times, although they can kind of overlap. I understood thus. This good thought has arisen in me, or this wholesome thought. This does not lead to my own affliction or to others' affliction, or to the affliction of both. It aids wisdom, so there's a positive, does not cause difficulties, and leads to nibbana. Get that? It leads to nibbana. The wholesome thought leads to nibbana. Wow. If I think and ponder upon this thought, even for a night, even for a day, even for a night and a day, I see nothing to fear from it. So there you go, Veronica. She's saying that it could be really helpful with chronic insomnia. So <laughs> if you are awake, you could have wholesome thoughts. You could keep on repeating thoughts of loving kindness and there'll be nothing to fear from not sleeping at night or from the thought itself. However, however, one caveat, this is only if you're going for deep jhanas now, so you're probably not quite ready for that while you, it's the middle of the night and you're tired. But with excessive thinking and pondering, I might tire the body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes disturbed. And when the mind is disturbed, I think in another sort of translation it says agitated. Uh, it is far from stillness. So I'm translating samadhi here as stillness, not as concentration. Again, a good indication of that, isn't it? Because we're talking about the mind becoming free from thought. That's more of a still state than a concentrated state. So I steadied my mind internally, quieted it, unified it and stilled it or concentrated it if you really like. Why is that? So that my mind should not be disturbed. So this is great because it's going again in stages, right? It might seem to contradict itself, but I think it's just a natural process that we start to veer away from the unwholesome thoughts and start to you know, cultivate the wholesome. And we can do that a lot. There's nothing to actually fear. It's not going to lead you into any sort of unwholesome state of mind. It's creating good karma, right? It's definitely creating a lot of good karma. And yet, if you continue with that, the only real danger is that you won't get into really, really deep silent states, obviously, right? Because they're the states that go beyond thinking. But I think it's pretty good if it's getting you close. <laughs> and uh, is it this one or the previous one? It's the next one, the Vitaka Santana Sutta. 
it's also the one that's about removal of uh, thoughts with the five methods. That is also known as the Adichitta Sutta, I think in the Chinese, Derek might know, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's right because I've heard that from other people, not because I speak Chinese. <laughs> Mind you, Adichitta just means uh, the higher mind in Pali. Uh, and the higher mind is again, a synonym for the jhanas. So the only problem with, um, with beautiful thoughts, with you know, thinking a lot about beautiful things is that you can't get into those really deep states as long as that thinking is continuing because he's saying that that will tire the body or might tire the body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes disturbed. So we all know how that feels. I know how that feels when I'm really, really tired and I want to meditate and it's like tired body often means tired mind. There's just not enough energy the brain isn't really working very well and you might want to fuzz out a little bit, you know, so you lose your awareness for a while or your brain sort of rests. And then sometimes you come back out of that fairly quickly and, you know, feel a bit refreshed. But yeah, when we're busy all day with sort of thinking and arranging and organizing, writing emails, then it can be quite exhausting, even if it's all for a good cause. So again, the method that he uses here to still his mind is just noticing, just noticing that the body is tired, the mind gets disturbed, and then it's far from the stillness, from the jhanas. So he steadies his mind internally, quietens it, unifies it, and stills it. So it's very systematic, very intentional. <laughs> Great, we've got the Chinese characters there, I can't remember actually say them, but I think they say Adichitta. <laughs> so, so there we go. So now we're at the point where the Buddha is starting to tire even of those thoughts. So bit by bit, you know, we're inclining to stillness, to peace, we're starting to see. I think also when your mind is full of wholesome thoughts, it brings a sense of well-being, doesn't it? It brings a sense of like comfort, ease. I've noticed with metta meditation, I can start off with repeating a lot of phrases and as the mind gets stiller, I just can't say all those phrases. You know, there's maybe really long gaps, maybe even for a whole hour. And then after that, maybe I, I need those phrases to start it up again. Uh, but after a while, it just flows and you just incline to more and more peaceful states. So I'll just finish this off and then we have a few more questions, comments, feedback, sharing. Okay, I promise to include the monks. So bhikkhus, whatever a bhikkhu frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of his mind. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of renunciation, he's abandoned the thought of sensual desire to cultivate the thought of renunciation. Then his mind inclines to thoughts of renunciation. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of benevolence, then he's abandoned the thought of ill will to cultivate the thought of benevolence. Then his mind inclines to thoughts of benevolence. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of harmlessness, he's abandoned the thought of harming to cultivate the thought of harmlessness. And then his mind inclines to thoughts of harmlessness. And I think there should be a little bit of celebration and rejoicing happening here, because just as we notice the harmful effects of harmful thoughts, it would be good to notice the beautiful effects of these thoughts and the beautiful fact that we have abandoned those other harmful thoughts whenever we're thinking these wholesome thoughts. You know, just to take a moment to recognize, yay, I'm not having a bad thought about anyone right now. Yeah, can we do that? Or do we only notice when we are having a bad thought? <laughs> It'd be really great, wouldn't it, if you could count all the moments of the day when you're not having bad thoughts. <laughs> There'd be so many more than there are when you're having the bad ones. And then we could delight in that. So just as in the last month of the hot season, when all the crops have been brought inside the village, so all the work is done, a cow herd would guard his cows or her cows or their cows while staying at the root of a tree or out in the open since they need only to be mindful that the cows are there. So too, there was a need for me only to be mindful that those states were there. 
So now we can really relax, we're on a roll. We just need to recognize them and the mind will stay because the mind is fairly intelligent. It does seek out its own good. It recognizes it, you get a taste. And you become reluctant to agitate the mind again once you've experienced beautiful states of loving kindness, harmlessness, renunciation. So we've done most of that sutta. There's a bit more in that sutta, but not a lot. So that's basically the content right there. So please do feel free to uh, comment. You can use the chat box. If you want to speak you know, aloud, we're not recording your video, only your voice. So your voice will be in the uh, recording, but you know it's pretty anonymous. Um, otherwise, please feel free to use the box. Someone has said, when we wake in the morning, offer these wholesome thoughts and also before you sleep. Yes, very good. That's what I always suggest in my meta sessions, or at least whenever I can remember. I should never say the word always. I should never say the word never also. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, there were so many opportunities throughout the day. And like you say, before we sleep, before we wake, where we're not on the computer, we're not busy, you know, we're not doing anything else. Why don't we just see if we can incline the mind slightly and get happy about that? Like I say before, we're not expecting quick results. It's about patience. It's culminative effort over days, months, weeks and years. But when you are practicing a long time, sometimes you look back to kind of five years ago, 10 years ago, and you think, wow, there has been some positive improvement, you know, and any amount of positive improvement is something to really celebrate because you wouldn't have that without this path, right? Imagine how many lifetimes you've been roaming around without a path, not really knowing where you're going. I mean, you see it in people, even if their life goes well, there's a kind of dimming of brightness and sparkle, you know, in most people if they don't really feel they've got a purpose, a deeper meaning in their lives. You're getting tired, you're getting older, there's been disappointments, maybe divorce, all kinds of things can happen in our lives. And uh, you know, to actually make steps on the path, to actually feel that you've developed in beautiful, wholesome qualities like contentment, generosity, forgiveness, peace, truth, honesty, trust, you know, this is massive. That's what you take with you when you die. You don't take your body. Hmm. John says, I really like the image of the shepherd now resting at the end of the harvest. Yeah, it's really lovely, isn't it? He only needs to know that the cows are there. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, he stays at the root of a tree or out in the open. Yeah, it's a beautiful image. You see that a lot in Asia, actually. And maybe in other countries too, where there's still quite a, a tradition of shepherding, etc. So I think Janaki again has her hand up. I want to know about the samadhi, the state of samadhi. Is it actually the tranquility that you reach in the mind? And um, so when the mind is, has reached the state of tranquility, that means we still keep on thinking, but um, isn't it? That does not mean that, I mean, because some, sometimes people say that it's a stillness of the mind, but uh, I uh, honestly don't understand that. So I just want to know, because we can't yeah. stop thinking, thinking goes on, but it's only good thoughts. Is it that, is it that? or the unification <laughs> of the mind? Okay. Okay, thanks for the question. So there's a difference between samadhi and samatha. So samatha is like calm. Samatha is like calming the mind and it has degrees. It's like there are different stages, right? The same with samadhi in a sense that you can say there's different levels of samadhi, but the word samadhi in the Eightfold Path, sama samadhi, it refers to the state of the four jhanas. And that is absolutely states without any thinking whatsoever. So it is possible to rid the mind of all thought, or let's say abandon thinking completely. 
And uh, there's a sutta, I don't remember where, it's probably in the Majjhima Nikaya, where one of the Jain, I think the Jain leader, actually, is it Niganta Nagaputta? Ooh, I forget now. I think it is. And he goes to the Buddha and he actually says, it's not possible to reach the state without thinking. It's not possible. Um, and he, no, actually, I think he goes to a disciple of the Buddha and says something like, I don't believe it's possible. And he says to this disciple, do you believe it's possible? And the disciple of the Buddha says, I don't believe it's possible either. And he says, see, see, it's not possible. The Buddha's disciple says it's not possible to stop thinking. And then the Buddha's disciple is quite cheeky. So he's been clever, right? He's been uh, playing with words, playing on words. And he says, I don't believe it's possible. I know it's possible. <laughs> And they're all oh, these disciples of the Lord Buddha, they are tricky, they're very tricky, he goes away, <laughs> feeling quite displeased, because this is the leader of one of the main religions, if not the main religion in India at that time, the Jain religion was even more widespread than the Buddhist uh, teaching at that time. Uh, so, yeah, so it is possible, and there are various degrees of stilling the mind, there's different stages towards those deep jhanas. And like you say, you know, first of all, we might notice unwholesome thoughts, then later on they start to change and become more wholesome, more kind, softer, you know, more peaceful maybe. And that's great. Don't worry about it. Don't worry that, oh, they're still thinking there. The Buddha says it's nothing to worry about. It's just natural that after a while we'll feel like tired by it. It's like a sense of nibida, like wanting to turn away. It's just a natural process. You know, the mind just feels I've had enough of that now. And it just allows itself to be quieter. So it's just a gentle, gentle, gentle stilling, a gentle sinking in to deeper states of peace. So it's all good. It's all part of a, a very wholesome and natural process. I hope that goes some way to help. So can we get to uh, Avanti? It's actually Matisha, but I'd like, <laughs> hi, you haven't spoken yet. And then we'll come to Maxwell if there's time. So hi, Venabhajan. Hi, hello. Um, I just wanted to mention something which crossed my mind. Um, you know, the states of wholesomeness which is talked about, I think sometimes, um, I wonder if, you know, you mentioned about having loving kindness um, and those being the wholesome thoughts, but uh, what about the sort of the more blank states of mind which is in the present moment? but not sullied by any unwholesome thoughts, mm -hmm. but sort of this sort of blank awareness kind of states, which yeah. seem to be very wholesome um, and actually carry with them a subtle, subtle kind of uh, happiness. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think those are sort of wholesome as well, aren't they? They're, yes, absolutely. They seem to be sort of reflecting more on the aloba, adosa, amoha. Yeah. So the, the, the negative, you know, this mentioning the negative, isn't it? Yes, the lack of uh, greed, hate exactly. and delusion. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, the beautiful thing about the Buddha's teaching is there's different ways to practice. There are ways that you can directly intentionally cultivate states of loving kindness. But also even the absence of greed, hate and delusion means that the mind will naturally have a certain degree of loving kindness because it's just the nature of the human mind. When it's free from ill will, what is remaining? It's not, you're not blank. You know, you might not feel full of bliss, full of happiness, but you may feel peace. Um, so I think sometimes if you just naturally go from maybe unwholesome thoughts or maybe not even unwholesome thoughts into a state where it's just quiet, but it's a, a kind of very wholesome quiet, there's nothing wrong with that at all. That's really beautiful and it's certainly a wholesome state. But then there's still scope for training in the wholesome thoughts throughout the day. Because in the daytime, we're not likely, unless, I don't know, unless you're Ajahn Brown and you can turn on and off thought when you want to, um, we're going to be having thought. So it's still really helpful to learn how to, you know, incline the mind towards a more wholesome thought and to substitute an unwholesome thought. It's still a really helpful practice. But you might not necessarily have to do that in your meditation if you're naturally getting into uh, some quiet place. And, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Nice to see you. Okay. And hello, Maxwell. Yeah, I, I was just going to say as well, um, every time I have a 
an unwholesome sort of thought, I try and think of a, a positive thought immediately yeah. afterwards about the same person or the same situation. And they came across an illustration the other day, because when we look at someone and someone who we feel we know very, very well, mm. we only see the base of the trunk of the tree. Mm. And they have the branches and the leaves, but we don't see all that. You know, mm. often when we make immediate judgments, we only see that little bit of the trunk. Yeah. So, and it was a lovely illustration I saw and it made me. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. It's wonderful that you're able to start doing that, you know, and maybe you've been doing that for a long time of just, you know, immediately um, putting in a different thought because it's challenging our perceptions, you know, it's kind of, okay, so I've had this particular thought arising. Is the opposite also true or is there a deeper truth? Is there a wider truth to this situation? You know, maybe you're, maybe you're right about that particular thing. You know, maybe you see that somebody is, say, maybe a bit stingy. It's not a wholesome thought, but maybe there's some mm. truth to it. Yeah. But on the other hand, for your own good, you can also say, yeah, but that person also does treat their children really well, or that person does care about their friends or, you know, offers something to charity when they can. Or, or maybe, you know, that person was brought up in a way that made them sort of feel that there's a lack you know that they need to struggle or they need to like yeah it's difficult to survive and that's maybe why they're you know not very generous whatever it is we can look at it from different angles and it, it gives us a much more um what's the word um uh, comprehensive perspective and even then it's only a tiny tiny fraction of the whole person we can never know another person we know that when we meditate we can barely know ourselves right how much of our own mind can we really predict? Can we really know? You know, there are, there are states that I certainly haven't experienced yet and I can't even comprehend how they might be. I can imagine, but the Buddha said, however you think it's gonna be, it's always gonna be different. So there's a lot we don't know about ourselves and about anyone else, yeah. So someone said, um, that I like the idea of training the mind into positive thinking habits, which will also hopefully lead to positive actions. And that's, yeah, absolutely the case. That's why the Buddha said, Chaitana aham kamam vadami. So intention is kamma. Intention is kamma. Because depending on the quality of your intention, your motivation, the motivation of the mind, it will determine whether the results of your actions of body and speech are wholesome or unwholesome you know everything starts in the mind first yeah that's also i think is it the first verse of the dhammapada mind matters most everything starts in the mind if one speaks or acts with an unwholesome mind then suffering follows wherever you go if you speak or act with a wholesome mind then uh, happiness just follows you like your own shadow it's very beautiful so we start in the mind. I mean, if we're turning around thinking, then yeah, we're, we're purifying from not the deepest level, but quite a deep level. Um, and as the Buddha said, it becomes the inclination of our mind. That means we're more and more likely to have verbal actions and bodily actions that follow the same, uh, the same train. You know? I mean, how can you have thoughts of loving kindness and then you know, do something harmful to somebody? It's very difficult. And there's another sutta where the Buddha says he's encouraging us to have uh, thoughts of loving kindness in public and in private, which is very beautiful because it's like you've seen a person in the day, maybe you had a nice time together, but then you go back and you start thinking nasty things about that person. <laughs> then when you see them again, you know, you're going to feel kind of a bit bad or like you might have a, a negative impression of them in your mind. But if you go back and practice thoughts of loving kindness about someone who you like or someone who you had difficulty with either, you just keep on reflecting on their goodness. You keep on thinking of them with loving kindness. Then it's amazing when you meet them. They might trigger you, but you're more likely to actually respond with loving kindness because you've been visualizing them in your mind. Like I notice that when I practice with a neutral person, I mean, I'm not having unpleasant or pleasant thoughts about a neutral person, right? But when I practice metta, I might see the neutral person who used to be neutral 
But because I've been having them in my mind and developing this relationship of metta, which seems to be only in my mind, when I see them, metta starts coming. <laughs> and they also respond to me differently. And it's like, wow, I've seemed to have created like this relationship of metta. It's incredible. And that's just one person doing the practice. So this is really powerful stuff. It's really powerful stuff. I'm going to read out the one last comment and then put it over to one of my co-hosties to say a few words on Dana at the end. So Sarah says, Ajahn Chah would say, keep your attention on your thoughts because your thought will become your behavior. Keep your attention on your behavior because it will become your habit. And your habit will become your character and your character will determine the karma of your life. That's really great, isn't it? And actually, I would say the whole thing is your karma. <laughs> the whole thing, you know, the thoughts create karma, your behavior creates karma, your habits, your character, the whole thing creates karma. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the character will create the kind of quality of our life, we could say. Absolutely. You know, if you have a good character, then you're likely to have good friends, right? Other people of good characters will be attracted to you. So very good. Thank you very much. No, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for offering that quote. And it may be the exact quote. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. So handing over to Gunther, I think, for a couple yeah, of minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this session, like all others, Venerable Chandra provides purely out of her compassion and this matter for everyone and us especially. If you feel like and are in a position to do, please consider making a donation towards supporting Venerable Chanda and her work and the Anukampa project, establishing the first Bikuni monastery in the UK. Mm -hmm. You can find out more about this project and how to donate at the Anukampa website and the Dana donation link in the chat box. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gunther. And thanks very much to all the co-hosts. You're absolutely awesome. Matthias is recording every week and Gunther is here every Friday too. Derek stood in today because uh, Kelly's not here, but uh, she's here, but she's listening quietly and just taking a rest. And so thank you. You're all just awesome. You make this happen for all of us. And uh, it's always very uplifting to be in this lovely group. So. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll see some of you hopefully on Sunday for Ajahn Brahmali's retreat, which is starting at 8.30 in the morning. So we'll see you hopefully at 8.15. Uh, I know a few of you are on that retreat, which is great. Uh, I know that Gunther was going to be, but his work took over. So I hope you can catch us on the live stream, Gunther, or on the uh, YouTube after that. So for anyone who's not on the retreat, we are live streaming the talks at 8.30 in the morning, an hour and a half. This is UK time, BST, British summer time. So 8.30 till 10, first talk by Ajahn Brahmali. 12 till 1.30 is the second talk with Ajahn Brahmali. And I think that will be the sutta discussion, although he might talk about suttas in every talk. <laughs> I tried to get him to do a straight Dhamma talk in the morning and then a sutta talk in the afternoon because his Dhamma talks are great too. Like when he's not following the sutta, you know, he's really good. Uh, and then in the evening, yeah, there'll be like a whole afternoon of free time practice, but then Matthias has very kindly offered to open up um, a silent practice session for you all to sit together between five and six. You have to join at five and it'll be just sitting silently. He'll ring a bell at the end. And then uh, 7.30 till nine, I'll be giving a little talk. <laughs> Probably I've got more content than I realize, but uh, yeah, a talk and guided med and Q&A. So it's going to be full and it runs from Sunday to uh, the following Sunday, I think. There's still some space. There's still some space if uh, anyone wants to join. And no, there can't be a sort of discussion next week because uh, the evening session is the same time. <laughs> so all the regular sessions next week are not happening. The next regular session, actually, we've got a bonus session on the 30th of May. Normally we have the Sunday sessions on the first and the third Sunday of the month, but I thought, well, let's have one on the fourth because you'll have missed the previous one. So on the 30th of May, uh, we have a, a really interesting session because we have another Bikuni from New Zealand. She's also a good friend of mine. She's coming to 
uh, share some. I'm basically going to question her because, yeah, she doesn't want to give a talk. So I'm going to just like make her give a talk by asking questions. <laughs> so that's what will happen. Good. Lovely. Lovely to see you. And now let's unmute you. If you wish, you can wave goodbye. <laughs>